We are back. Visual Politic viewers, we are sorry that we've not been with you for the last few weeks, but I can tell you that it has not been a vacation. I'll tell you more about it at the end of the video, but now let's get started. Israel is at war. We didn't want this war. It was forced upon us in the most brutal and savage way. But though Israel didn't start this war, Israel will finish it. Once the Jewish people were stateless, once the Jewish people were defenseless, no longer. But that is issue one. حركة حماس فتحت أبواب جهنم على قطاع غزة. حماس أخذت القرار وحماس راح تتحمل المسؤولية وثمن عمل. Fifteen years ago, as head of the Southern Command, I came close to breaking the neck, destroying of Hamas. I was stopped by the political echelon. This phenomenon will not continue. We will change reality on the ground in Gaza for the next 50 years. What was before will be no more. We will operate at full force. It is often said that reality always trumps fiction. And you know what? This time was no different compared to what has recently transpired in Israel. The antics of Doron in Fauda. The popular Netflix series seems like nothing more than a sweet romantic soap opera in the early hours of Saturday 7th of October 2023. While most of Israel was still asleep, hundreds upon hundreds of Hamas and Islamic Jihad militants rushed from Gaza to storm into Israel by land, sea, and air. They did so at the same time as they launched a massive and unexpected barrage of thousands of rockets on the Hebrew country. The result? Nearly 3,000 wounded, nearly 200 hostages, and more than 1,300 dead. The vast majority of them, civilians. That's because the civilians were precisely the target. The executions perpetrated. The beheadings and the general level of brutality exhibited by the Palestinian militias has surpassed anything we have seen so far. It was the biggest blow to Israel in almost 75 years. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu's government has declared all-out war on Hamas and launched the largest mobilization in history. At least 360,000 reservists are expected to be mobilized, but all this you already know. The questions we now have to ask are, who was really behind such an operation? How is it possible that Israel and its renowned intelligence services did not know about it? What are the consequences of this conflict? Visual Politic viewers, we are going to answer all these questions for you, so let's get on with it. The Brains of the Operation Pay attention to this message. In light of the continuing crimes against our people, in light of the orgy of occupation and its denial of international laws and resolutions, and in light of American and Western support, we've decided to put an end to all this. Keep this name in mind, Mohammed Daif. As this message was being broadcast, hundreds and hundreds of Hamas fighters were advancing on the fence, separating Gaza from Israel as a massive barrage of rockets attempted to overwhelm the Iron Dome, the air defense system that protects Israel's skies. Within hours, militants from Hamas's military wing, the Qassam Brigades, killed more than 1,300 people, wounded thousands, and took hundreds of hostages, and ended any sense of security in Israel. They even took control of two military bases and destroyed a dozen armored vehicles. The assailants far exceeded any reasonable expectation of destruction. Okay, we just said it. The Qassam Brigades, the military wing of Hamas piloted this operation. But who was really in charge of this mission, of Hamas's biggest triumph in decades? Who was the real leader, the mastermind of the operation? Well, remember a moment ago, I told you to remember this name, Mohammed Daif. Well, everything indicates that it was precisely this obscure Hamas commander who was the pilot, the driver, the director of this entire savage operation that neither the Shin Bet nor Mossad nor military intelligence was able to anticipate. Muhammad Daif had been in Israel's crosshairs for decades. We're talking about a guy who nearly lost his life in an Israeli airstrike 20 years ago, after which he lost an arm, a leg, a part of his vision, leaving him wheelchair bound. We're talking about a guy of whom there is only one known photograph, the one you are seeing on the screen, and for years was involved in making explosives, directing a lot of suicide bombings, and piloting the plan to build tunnels under Gaza. Tunnels that Hamas has used both to receive supplies from Egypt 
Egypt and to try to attack Israel. Even before this, Deef was like a sacred personality and very much respected both within Hamas and by the Palestinians. His biggest operation against Israel will have now turned him into a figure like a god to the young. Don't doubt it for a moment. Mohammed Daif is now at the top of Israel's list of priority targets. Now, if we're talking about brains, we cannot ignore perhaps the one who has been the ultimate instigator of the operation. I am referring to Ishmael Ghani, Suleimani's successor as the head of the Quds Force, the elite unit of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Now, to what extent could we speak of the direct involvement of Iran in this whole savage operation? Well, that is precisely what security officials in Israel, the United States, and other Western countries are now trying to clarify. But don't doubt it for a moment, in one way or another. This is just the latest chapter in the long-running Cold War between Iran and Israel. A conflict that in recent years has provoked a lot of covert operations on the part of both countries. Mossad, for example, has managed to kill many of those responsible for the Iranian nuclear program, and in 2022, even attempted a drone attack on the facilities of this program. Iran, for its part, has has reinforced military supplies to groups such as Hamas and Hezbollah. Not only that, but in early September and early October, leaders of these military organizations met with the heads of the Quds Force. We'll be talking about this in detail very soon here on Visual Politic. Don't forget to subscribe to stay tuned for all the videos coming. And in a moment, in this very video, we'll tell you what the implications of Iran's involvement in this whole mess might be. But first, we have to answer a question that I'm sure all of you, absolutely all of you, have been wondering lately. Where the hell was the Israeli military? What could explain the fact that the supposedly best intelligence services in the world didn't notice anything? Well, we're gonna take a look at that right now. Where was the army? The assault on dozens of enclaves in southern Israel and the point-blank murder of civilians, including children and the elderly in the streets, in public buildings and residential neighborhoods in the south of the country, has caused a tremendous shock in Israeli society. After all, although they are more than used to extreme situations in this country, the Israelis have not suffered such a severe blow within their own borders since way back in 1948. So the question, the big question is, how could it be that the Israeli government, its army, and and its intelligence agencies didn't know anything about the attack. How could the Palestinians effortlessly cross one of the best protected borders in the world? A border worth over $1 billion designed precisely so that something like this couldn't happen. Why did it take so long for the Israeli army to intervene? Well, let's take it one step at a time. First of all, we cannot understand anything of what happened if we do not pay attention to what has been the informal relationship between Hamas and the Israeli government during recent months. You see, as I am sure you will know, Israel and Saudi Arabia have been very close to each other in order to get Riyadh to join the Abraham Accords and to recognize the Hebrew country once and for all. To achieve this, the Israeli government was trying to keep things at home from going haywire. One of the methods they were using was precisely an economic one. You see, for quite a few months now, Israel has been easing part of its blockade on the Gaza Strip. For example, it was handing out more and more permits for Gazans to work in Israel. And considering that this is a very poor territory where there are no jobs, this was no small measure. What's more, the agreement with Saudi Arabia would also have brought a huge injection of aid money to Palestine. I guess one of the calculations within Israeli intelligence was that since Israel is taking these measures and relieving the pressure on the people in Gaza, it would avoid such a hard move. On top of that, the enormous military superiority and the Iron Dome itself had contributed to a huge sense of security throughout the country. That a two-day music festival with about 3,000 attendees would be held at the gates of Gaza was a good example of this general feeling. In other circumstances, naturally, it would never have been allowed. The problem is that this general sense of security might have led to a lack of preparedness, carelessness, and less than a rigorous and cautious assessments. And guess what? In a way, that is what explains the terrible mistake made by the intelligence services. The biggest failure since the Yom Kippur War in 1973, when Egypt and Syria launched a coordinated attack. 
Even so, Israel has since developed the most formidable intelligence service in the region, if not the world. Intensive use of technology and a huge network of informants, both within the Palestinian territories and in countries such as Lebanon, Syria, and even Iran, have made it virtually impossible to catch the Israeli big eyes off guard. And yet, in spite of everything, this is precisely what has happened. Why? Did they really not know what was going on? Well, let's just say that that's not the real story. The truth is that despite the stealth and discretion with which Hamas seems to have carried out preparations in recent months, both the Shin Bet, the intelligence service that deals with Palestinian affairs, and the army's own intelligence detected many Hamas movements in the days leading up to the disaster. Nevertheless, these same intelligence services were convinced of three things. Firstly, that for Hamas, the priority in Gaza was to improve the economic situation, and that under under no circumstances was it interested in a confrontation with Israel that would ultimately result in heavy operational losses. In fact, one of the main arguments put forward by Hamas in its power struggle with the Palestinian Authority is that they govern better, are less corrupt, and achieve better results. Israel made a big mistake in believing that a terrorist organization can change its DNA. Secondly, that on a political level, Hamas would seek to act primarily in the West Bank, both to destabilize its rivals in the Palestinian National Authority and to take advantage of the growing tension caused by the religious Zionists in the Israeli government regarding the promotion of new settlements. And thirdly, they were convinced that given the circumstances and the poor socio-economic situation, Hamas needed to maintain at all costs the flow of financial assistance from Qatar, a country that has put up more than $1 billion since 2012. What the Arab country is asking for, however, is peace on the border. Well, due to these three key factors, in September, the Israeli army described the situation in Gaza as relatively stable. Worse still, in their assessment of events, they understood that the movements of the military wing of Hamas in Gaza in recent weeks were nothing more than maneuvers designed to unnerve them. Indeed, the fact that these maneuvers were relatively large convinced them that they would go nowhere. The intelligence interpretation is that they were training for something that they would never dare to do. In other words, the intelligence services did have knowledge of significant movements and maneuvers in the days leading up to the attack. However, they simply did not consider it relevant. This was perhaps Hamas's great success, not so much hiding the preparations as convincing the Israelis that nothing was going on. So okay, the intelligence services failed, but what about the armed forces? How is it possible that it failed to repel the invasion? Are we supposed to be talking about one of the best militaries in the world? This is a failure that is no smaller than the Yom Kippur War. I am surprised by the failure not only of the overall intelligence, but also of the tactical forces. Even if they were surprised, you would expect the Gaza Division to do a much better job in defending the border. Well, in a way, it has a lot to do with everything we have just told you. The Israeli government was absolutely convinced that everything went through the West Bank, that both Hamas and Islamic Jihad had the fundamental objective of strengthening their base in this area of Palestine in order to start operating from there and thereby gain influence and local power. We're talking about creating commandos, launching rockets, and digging tunnels. Without going any further, this is what Ziad al nakhali the leader of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad group, reportedly said in June in a meeting with Iranian leader Ali Khamenei. Check it out. We, as Palestinians and as resistance forces and movements, understand the importance of arming the West Bank, but this requires efforts from the Palestinians themselves and also the assistance of our brothers in the Islamic Republic of Iran. If we add to these suspicions the fact that Netanyahu's new partners, the religious Zionists, have their electoral strength, especially in the Israeli settlements of the West Bank, well, you can already guess where the shots were going. Between one and two dozen battalions of the Israel Defense Forces, usually deployed in Gaza, moved into the West Bank. The South was left largely empty. 26 battalions, almost all regular IDF, are in the territories. There is almost no army in the South, all by decision of an extreme right-wing government. The result? The Palestinian militants were given a free hand, and when they rushed the border with troops, drones, rockets, and even artillery, nothing could stop them. To top it all off, it took between six and nearly 10 hours to be transferred to the enclaves invaded by the Palestinians. It was a disaster. Now that we know how Hamas was able to get away with it, the big question that remains to be answered is why? 
What was the purpose of this whole operation? Well, there is a lot to be said here. It seems quite clear that the main objective of the operation was to derail the agreement between Israel, the United States, and Saudi Arabia, in which Saudi Arabia would join the so-called Abraham Accords. That is, an agreement that would normalize its relations with the Hebrew country. That would have been a severe blow to Palestine, but especially also to Iran, and probably to Russia. On the table was a new security agreement, and perhaps also an increase in oil production. Be that as it may, the scenario currently looks more uncertain than ever. It remains to be seen what will happen with the hostages. The possibility of the creation of two states may have been derailed for decades. And what is even more disturbing, if Hezbollah were to attack Israel, that could end up triggering a huge regional conflict. We will stay tuned and we will let you know in future videos all the extra details you know here on Visual Politic. By the way, as I said at the beginning of the video, yes, we have been away from YouTube for some time, but we've not been on vacation. We've been preparing a lot of changes. Now, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. If you haven't already done so, thank you so very much for joining us. All the best. See you next time.